Welcome this morning. We're on chapter 9, and it is still continuing the family of Gideon. That's chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, he must have been a really important person to get four chapters in the Bible, 100 uh, verses. So we look at this uh, uh, portion, and uh, I'm going to call our lesson Dealing with the Ruin that Comes from Within. Dealing with the Ruin that Comes from Within. This time it was not the Midianites and the Amorites uh, and the children of the East. No, no. It was the family of uh, Gideon himself. So, before we look at the Word of God in uh, Judges chapter 9, let's look to the God of the Word who gave this Word originally. And join me, therefore, in a prayer as we begin. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your Word. It is always fresh. It is still your Word, and you still have left it for all the nations of the earth to read and to heed. Help us, therefore, this day to make a response by the working of your Holy Spirit because we are your children and we are dwelt by your Holy Spirit who takes the word and uses it as a hammer to help us, to instruct us, to guide us, and to serve us in the worship of the true and living God. For that reason, therefore, we pray, come Holy Spirit in all of your power as we study this lesson. For it's in your name we pray, amen. We begin with the city of Shechem. Uh, my son Brian has put a nice map here and no wonder Shechem, which means shoulder, uh, there were two mountains on either side of this city. The Hebrew way of saying this is Shechem, Shechem. And uh, they uh, had on the south side was Mount Gerizim, and on the north side of this city, uh, was Mount Ebal. Uh, and they were told in by Moses back in the Pentateuch, when they got in the land, they were to have half the people and half the tribes go on Mount Gerizim and half the tribes on Mount Ebal. And they were to say antiphonally, that is one after another, they were to say a blessing, then a curse, a blessing, then a curse, a blessing, then a curse. And they uh, gave that in this city. Uh, the valley that was between them was called the navel of the land. You can see why that's so. It looks like uh, Brian has put a blue arrow right in the middle, halfway between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. And they called this the navel of the land, or the belly button of the land. This was the valley that was pretty much central in the whole land of uh, Israel. The judges are listed here too as well, the major judge has an underline, uh, and the uh, minor judges uh, just have their name but no underlining in this uh, map affair. So th the capture of Shechem by Joshua or by the Israelites is nowhere mentioned in the Bible. 
This is amazing. We wonder how they came to take this city. Did they just take it as part of its Canaanite heritage and made a treaty with it? Uh, it's a question that bothers biblical readers for a long time. Uh, and yet, it's a time early in Israel's history where a covenant renewal ceremony was held uh, on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and in between the two of them, Joshua 8, verse 30 through 35. So somehow, Israel was able to lay claim to this site. Nevertheless, Shechem had a hallowed history. It was the first city that Abraham touched as he came on his journey from Haran to Canaan. And it was also, secondly, uh, where the Lord began to reveal himself to Abraham in the land of Canaan. Genesis 12, verses 6 to 7. Later on, Jacob lived there with his sons along with the people of Shechem who were called the sons of Hamor, H-A-M-O-R. Uh, and that was until the son the, of the chief of the sons of Hamar said, I want to marry one of uh, the sons of uh, Jacob, whose name was uh, Dinah. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, well, here's our deal. Uh, they, they, if all of you people, the sons of Hamar, will become circumcised, then uh, you can marry uh, this girl. Well, uh, while they were still uh, sore and hurting from the uh, uh, circumcision, uh, Simeon, one of the tribe leaders, and Levi, another tribe leader, killed the people in Shechem, killed them all off. They weren't able to fight back very well, and it was a wholesale genocide. Uh, and this was because the chief son had already raped uh, Di their sister Dinah in Genesis 33, verses 18, through Genesis 34, verse 31. So Israel had quite a history with his city of Shechem, or Shechem. Later still, we have a most important letter of a group of uh, over 300 letters in Egypt called Tel Amar. A woman was out scraping up uh, loose dirt for her garden when she came across this collection of tablets, which was correspondence from the people, leaders, uh, the kings and chiefs in uh, Canaan, saying to Egypt, come help us. There is a people invading us who are called the Habiru. H-A-B-I-R-U. Now, some of us think that was their reference to the Hebrews because the time fits exactly right. But liberal scholars were adamant. No, it can't be. The Bible is not a book of truth anyway. Uh, but some of us think it is. And therefore, uh, it, in this letter, uh, it says here that uh, 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 Shechem had fallen into the hands of the Habiru in the 14th century B.C. 
Uh, and I think scholars are going to one day give up and say, here are almost 400 letters written usually in uh, uh, some Canaanite language or are uh, written in cuneiform, which is those wedge-shaped kinds of things. If you think of a toothbrush and sharpen it on its end to a point, that's what it looked like. They would take the wet clay and would put that down and then they would leave a long thin part uh, which would make a uh, line or a wedge. And uh, we had to study that in Brandeis uh, for the code of Hammurabi. Uh, first day we went into class, a uh, teacher said, uh, uh, I called on someone, turn to law number 58. And he pointed to one of the new students and said, would you please read that? Well, he'd never seen cuneiform before, but fortunately, all of us had been warned. This teacher is like that. The first day you go in, memorize all the signs and be able to read them. Uh, for sure enough, that's what he wanted. And he got it uh, every day uh, by uh, doing that. Well, there are four uh, sort of times in which that city is very, very important, including this fourth one, which is a Tel Amarna letter found in Egypt where he complains, come help me, these people called the Habiru, at least that's what they called them, which sounds very close to Hebrew, uh, are invading the, the land. In fact, uh, there's even a fifth reference here, and that is Joseph, when he died, he wanted his bones taken to Canaan, and they did, and they found a resting place for Joshua. Where? Shechem, in Joshua 24, verse 32. So there are five important references uh, to this city, even though many of the Shechemites apparently were also called the men of Hamor, H-A-M-O-R, Judges 9, verse 28. And they worshiped the God. What was the name of their god? Baal Barit. Well, Baal, we know. Who's this Barit? Covenant means covenant. The Baal of a covenant. So Shechem was located on the crossroads of trade in Canaan. And it's right in the middle of the land. No wonder it's referred to that valley as the navel of uh, Israel. So uh, Abimelech, however, was not another judge. The focal point will be verse 56, 57. God repaid, thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech uh, that he had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. God also made the people at Shechem pay for all their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jerubbabel, that's another name for Gideon, remember, uh, uh, came to him. So this lesson, dealing with the ruin, the destruction that comes from within. And I want to follow here Five steps. First, Abimelech seizes the throne at Shechem, verses 1 to 6. Then the youngest son of 70 that uh, 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 Gideon had, his name is Jotham, J-O-T-H-A-M. Uh, Jotham uh, had a parable no, it was a fable, actually, 
And he went up on top of Mount Gerizim, which apparently is very good acoustically because it reverberates across that valley. And so he gave his response to Abimelech seizing power and killing off all of his brothers. So not Abimelech and not Jotham, but 68 other siblings of this man. Uh, he had that many children by marrying many wives. So you can imagine it must have been a menagerie uh, but then, that's in verses 7 through 21. The third step is the demise of Abimelech, and then finally the conclusion, which I just read to you, verses 56 and 57. So let's get into the first step, which is Abimelech seizes the throne at Shechem. Uh, let me read the passage for you. It's in Judges 9, verses 1 through 6. Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them and to all his mother's clan, Ask all the citizens at Shechem, which is better for you, to have all 70 of Jerubbabel's sons rule over you, or just one? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. Yeah, why? He was the son of a concubine. This concubine's name is never given here. We don't know who she is any more than that she comes from and was a native of Shechem. So reading on verse 3, when the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is related to us. Yeah, he was half related. And they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of baal -Berit. Uh They gave him, yeah, they stole it from their own uh, deity. And Abimelech used it to hire reckless scoundrels. Uh, and in other words, uh, people who were really uh, the scoundrels of that day and who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Ophrah, not Winfrey, but this Ophrah, which was uh, um, uh, about 30 miles north of uh, Shechem. And on one stone, he murdered his 70 brothers. Now, two of them, got a, one got away, and of course Abimelech also got away. So they're referred to as a unit here, his 70 brothers, the sons of Jerubbabel. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, escaped by hiding. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. And when Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may be pleased, may listen to you. That's interesting. This young boy gave an interesting thing. He said, listen to me. I'm going to be your preacher for today. And if you listen to me, then God will listen to you. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting sort of uh, tit for tat? Uh, if you want to get uh, good things from God, listen to your pastor. <laughs> that God will listen to you. See law. Well, at any rate, uh, that's the whole situation here. Uh, once any one of God's people know the steps to ruin and to complete failure, they have opportunity to avoid that destruction 
along with its complete failure uh, and trap that it sets up. So we're going to learn something. There may be here a model for us today. For Abimelech, along with Israel, started on this uh, path of decline into ruin and destruction. How did he start that? First of all, he forgot the majesty of God. And uh, forgetting all he that Gideon had done by God's help by delivering them from the fairly recent Midianite incursions. Judges 8, verses 33 through 35. <coughs> so Israel had adopted the idol of Baal Bari as their deity. That's some thanks to God. God delivers them after seven years in which the Midianites come just as the crops get ready and uh, they are being uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, de-shelled and uh, the shells are marked off them and they take the grain and make their bread from the wheat and from the rye and from the oats and they take their cattle too as well. And so what do they do in thanks for all this? Uh, they go home and Israel, when they're finally delivered, they say, oh, we need to give thanks to Baal Bari. Nice going, guys. Nice going. And as a consequence of acting this way, they ignored the grace of God. Judge Gideon in those days had married many wives. You can figure that out. Seventy kids? Uh, okay, I don't have to draw pictures. Uh, and uh, 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 again, this was against the teaching of the Lord. And uh, he had a son born to him by a concubine who came from the city of Shechem. It may well be then that this city may have been a Canaanite town which was incorporated into Israel through an alliance uh, with the men of Hamar. Doesn't say, but the, the question is, how did Shechem become so closely related to them? What provoked a lot of trouble in this case was the fact that Abimelech decided to trade on the fact that his mother, a concubine a came from that city of Shechem. So Abimelech put the bug in the ear of his mother's relatives that don't you think it would be a lot better if one ruled you rather than 70? Uh, and it just might be more advantageous for you Shechemites to have one person uh, such as myself, uh, which is uh, a very humble way of putting things. Uh, chapter 9, verse 2, which I read for you. So the mental picture of such a cacophony of 70 rulers scared the living daylights out of the people of Shechem. Uh, and so Abimelech's plan was to get uh, the post of ruler uh, and he would be that ruler. Abimelech's uh, half-brothers or whoever the, the town that of Shechem must have decided that uh, Abimelech's logic was correct. Seventy rulers certainly was too many. So they gave Abimelech 70 pieces of silver as campaign money from which funds he went out and uh, got uh, uh, people uh, 
with the money he got from Baal Bari Temple. It's interesting they had set up a temple in that town of Shechem too. Uh, and so uh, Abimelech used this campaign donation of 70 pieces of silver as a means of hiring, the Bible says, verse 4, reckless adventurers who became his followers. So uh, together with uh, Abimelech, the men of Shechem, slew all but two of Gideon's sons, including Abimelech and uh, also the youngest son. So it happened that Abimelech organized these ruthless hirelings to travel from Shechem 30 miles north to Ophrah, uh, Gideon's hometown. Remember, he came from Ophrah, uh, and uh, he hired them to do what? Go 30 miles north and slaughter 68 of his father's sons on one stone. For one got away, named Jotham, and Abimelech was not included in that number. Uh, and so, uh, Jotham, uh, meaning the Lord or Yahweh, has shown himself to be perfect. The Lord has shown himself to be complete. Uh, Joe Tom, Joe Tom. Uh, Joe is Jehovah or Yahweh, and Tom is perfect. So, with the death of 68 half-brothers, Abimelech had achieved his goal, and he was officially proclaimed king of Shechem. And they began to hold a coronation ceremony to install their native son, Abimelech, at the, quote, oak of a pillar. Now, usually when they had installation services, it was always alongside an oak, or even in Israel's later times, it was alongside the pillar in the house of God. This site was perhaps a sacred tree in the area of the sanctuary to Baal Bari. And they took one stone or pillar and propped it up against this oak tree to represent Baal Bari, as was the case in several other locations. Read 2 Kings 3.10 or 2 Kings 10, verse 26 and 27. So we come now to Jotham's response. It was quite a response, verses 7 through 21. I've already read verse 7. And so listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day the trees went out. Here's the fable. One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves, and they said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, Should I give my oil, by which both gods and man, uh, or human beings, are honored to hold sway over the trees? Next the trees went to a fig tree, Come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, Should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? Then the trees said to the vine, uh, uh, grapevine, for example, Come and be our king. But the vine answered, Should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and human beings to hold sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees 
said to the thorn bush, Come and be our king. Now the thorn bush said to the trees, If you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. Shade? Are you kidding? A thorn bush which creeps along the ground isn't going to give any shade. These guys got to get really low down if they want shade. Uh, but if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. The legendary, tall, powerful, magnificent uh, wood, cedar wood, which was priced, and remember they made the temple out of the cedar wood in the days of Solomon. So, uh, verse 16, have you acted honorably in good faith by making Abimelech king? Have you been fail, fair to Gideon or Jeroboam and his family? Have you treated him as he deserves? Remember that my father fought for you and risked his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian. But today you've revolted against my father's family. You have murdered his 70 sons on a single stone and have made Abimelech, the son of his female slave, king over the citizens of Shechem because he is related to you. So uh, have you acted honorably and in good faith toward Jeroboam and his family today? If you have, may Abimelech be your joy, and may you be his uh, too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let the fire come out of you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume you. Abimelech. Uh, then Jotham fled, escaping to Beer, and he lived there because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. Wow. Uh, the Bible has few fables in which animals or uh, things in nature talk and uh, speak, but it clearly indicates when that is happening, that it is a fable and the rest of the Bible is not to be put in the same class. Abimelech's plan would have worked perfectly except for one small detail. And that was the youngest son of Jeroboam named Jotham. He had escaped the sword that had devoured his brothers uh, in Ophrah. And this he did by hiding himself from the executioners. Presumably the search team gave up for the time being in their search because they had to stop and go back 30 miles south to the ceremony of the installation of their native son Abimelech. And while he was getting uh, underway, Jotham made his way south toward Shechem, where he was the lone escapee. He climbed up on Mount Gerizim. Nancy and I have been there, and it is uh, quite a beautiful sight, these two mountains looking across at each other with the valley in between where the city of Shechem, Shechem is uh, nestled. Um, so he climbed up on Mount Gerizim uh, to deliver a searching and deep message uh, for those assembled there. Surprisingly, he put it in the form of a fable. Jotham's speech had two main parts, the fable, verses 8 to 15, and the fable's interpretation, verses 16 through 20. In doing so, Jotham brought what 
was equivalent to a lawsuit against the nobility in Shechem in the name of his father, Jeroboam, or Gideon. Mount Gerizim is known today as Jebel El Tor and is located on the south side of the Nablus Valley, overshadowing the city of Shechem. Uh, so Jotham now, situated at the top of Mount Gerizim, lifted up his voice, probably interrupting the pageantry of the installation that was taking place outside of Shechem near the oak tree. Uh, and as he trumpeted forth the words of the official proclamation, he said, listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. Verse eight of chapter nine. Whether the Lord would give a favorable response or not dependent on whether the Shechemites listened to the Lord and then followed the fable. So here's how the fable goes. He described how some in the past rejected a call to governance of the city, whom he likened to favored trees. Once upon a time, the trees went forth to anoint a ruler. Imagine this is what they would would uh, would uh, uh, what they would do, you know. Well, uh, would anyway. So the first tree was an olive tree, which was offered <coughs> the title of king. However, the olive tree would not be deterred from its highest calling which it stated just outright and said, hey, uh, why should I leave my main purpose in life, which came at creation to bear olives? And the olive tree was not impressed by the call. Uh, and it knew this invitation to royalty uh, would not end in the very function for which that tree had been created. So the olive tree declined. And it was offered to a fig tree. Uh, and it was approached next, but it too said, no, I won't be able to carry out the main purpose God gave me when he created me to produce figs. Why should I give that up uh, uh, and take away the sweetness I give to mankind, no, I decline. The third tree was contacted, which was the vine. But it too said, no, how can I stop providing wine to cheer both God and men? And uh, I, I'm not interested. So all three trees were content and happy with the roles God had given to them. How important it is to recognize what is the gift God has given to us and the purpose for our lives and to be happy. Godliness with contentment, says the book of uh, uh, Timothy, is great gain. Great gain. You really want to get ahead? Then recognize what God has given to you and use it to his glory and be happy with that. Well, in desperation, the trees turned to the thorn bush, a bramble. Uh, it's a, a species of beck, buckhorn. And uh, his choice of buckhorn is significant for nothing of value comes from buckhorn. Not even the wood is worth anything. Moreover, it's just plain pests. And when it begins to creep into the edges of a farm, it spreads quickly all across the whole farm. Added to that fact 
was the potential it offered for being a real fire hazard. For a slow spreading branches of dry tinder could catch fire easily and spread like gangbusters. So the thorn bush or bramble is only too glad to receive this honorific invitation, verse 15. And the bramble also knew how to use the right lingo, for it flippantly said, if in truth, look who's talking about truth, if in truth you really want to anoint me, king over the trees, come and take refuge in my shade. Are you kidding? Buddy, you have no shade to offer. You're just a low, creepy uh, uh, bramble bush. Uh, and uh, brambles give no shade. They're incapable of offering any protection to anyone. Instead, the bramble in this story will turn out to be none other than creepy Abimelech himself. His desire for leadership is one for which he is especially noted, and the bramble fits him well. Jotham proceeded to give the interpretation to the fable. He began by appealing to the conscience of the Shechemites, verse 16. Had they as a people really acted truthfully and sincerely when they offered Abimelech the kingship? No, they had not. Now, double think while I'm saying this. This is so current. And you've got to ask, with our present administration, did they think clearly when they said that? And uh, why the adamant hate against another man who is not in himself deserving, but at least when he got in office, whether uh, focus on the family was correct, who said he had a conversion experience. No one's been able to validate that, that Trump was, had a conversion experience. But from that point on, though he had a past it was like the past of many in the Bible, like the past of many of contemporary note. Uh, yet, uh, during that reign, they found it impossible to raise something against them. Abimelech had not treated his brothers in the most uh, respectable way he could. He had not treated his father uh, uh, for he cast his life in front of the Midianites' uh, collusion and rescued that whole tribe from what they were facing. But there's no appreciation to him for that, verse 17. Therefore, Jotham argued that all of them as Shechemites were doing was nothing less than raising an insurrection against their own father's house this day. For in accepting this renegade son from his Shechemite concubine, they were likewise guilty of the crime of murdering Gideon's sons. For they were complicit in the crime. <clears throat> so if the men of Shechem wanted to really act honorably, Jathan left it in the hands of God to determine if it was so. But if they had not acted with truth and honor, then let fire come out of Abimelech and let it devour them. And God says the same thing to potentates who have taken over the throne or dynasties in our day and who did it in crooked means and by crooked ways. And therefore, the Bible says, let fire come out of God. I kid you not. This is a teaching of the word of God. Verses 20 and 21. 
Then Jotham fled and ran for his life. So we take up the demise of Abimelech, verse 22, following the rest of the chapter. After Abimelech governed, oh, they don't use the word reigned. No, no, they didn't make him king anyway. He was governor, uh, and so they used the word sarar, sarar uh, in uh, Hebrew, which means it's the word used for captain or for an official, but not the word you'd use for king or for a ruler. So Abimelech governing for three years, that would be about 1151 B.C. to 1149 B.C. Obviously, the men of Shechem refused to dignify his leadership with the verb to rule and to reign. That should have been a sign to them. Should have been a sign. The truthfulness of Jotham's speech comes to pass quickly. Verses 22 to 23. This happened because God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Verse 23. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a son of a prophet, and my father was a farmer, so I'm not that. And I've worked all my life for nonprofit organizations, so I can't spell either. But I wanted to let you know that this God sent an evil spirit. Are you watching something in the news? What's broken out? Hostility between the men who put our recent governor who is ruling us and hostility between them. And now it's a rush between now and November 4th to find out who is going to take the place, if anyone, or will he be able to sustain his place as president of the United States. This meant that God permitted an evil spirit of rough discord and wicked treachery to break out as jealousies between Abimelech and the people of Shechem. And it's quite clear that many of those who were at the basement council who counseled President Biden are now saying, no, he really should take some kind of test because we think he is failing. So he should not go for another uh, four years. So a contest is now on. Who will win? How will they win? This story is practically a model of what is happening in our day. So uh, they turn to insurrections, they turn to civil unrest, they turn to bloodshed, and the Shechemites broke the covenant they had made. Watch the DA, uh, a woman in Georgia, watch the DA in New York, how with such great arrogance and I need now a, a Jewish word, uh, uh, chutzpah, uh, that they uh, uh, sort of uh, sport uh, where they are going. The cruelty perpetrated on the sons of Gideon by Abimelech and the men of Shechem who aided him was known by God. Verse 24. Therefore, the narrative continues in verse 25 by telling just how an evil spirit of dissension began to produce the expected effects. Ladies and gentlemen, we're watching this. We're watching this. Perhaps during the time when Abimelech was absent for a period of time, therefore the men of Shechem organized 
a conspiracy against Abimelech, and the very same man they had so recently hailed and cheered as a native son, and the new official, after three years, after three years, after three years, it was all over. It is important to note, however, that God is often pleased to punish the evil, what the evil persons have executed on others by the exact same persons who had contributed to elevating the offender in the first place. Are you watching? Are you watching here? The spirit of anarchy grew in strength in the land as a man named Gaal. Now we've got another character coming here. Character number three. We had Abimelech, who is a non-judge. And then we had Jotham, his youngest son. And now G-A-A-L, which means to loathe, to loathe, to despise. The son of Ebed. He came to Shechem, he once was a citizen of Shechem, but he had with him an armed band of soldiers. So this man is like a Hamas, uh, uh, and uh, it's sort of natural for him to spot weaknesses in Abimelech's governing uh, in the city of Shechem. And so Gaal noticed there was a political vacuum that had developed uh, between the men of Shechem and Abimelech. And so they were now favoring him instead, for he used to live there, Gaal, G-A-A-L. Gaal seemed to be more than a former resident, for when he returned to the people of Shechem, they celebrated his return by throwing a wild party, verse 27. And the excitement of those celebrating can be seen by their going out in the fields to gather grapes. And when the fruit they had uh, picked brought in, they put it into a wine press and began trampling on it. You take off your uh, sandals and you uh, just press down the grapes in your bare feet uh, uh, while hanging on to a kind of trolley strap that is in the impromptu uh, uh, thing that was put overhead. And they would press and press with uh, maybe uh, two feet of grapes that are there squishing it and the juice comes sprouting up all over your clothes, uh, etc. And I suppose with the dirt between your toes, that sort of helps the fermentation. <laughs> this is an added note not found in the scriptures. Uh, so at any rate, uh, they uh, they start tramping and singing and give their praise to whom? Not Abimelech, who said, my father could have been king. Avi, my father, Melech, king. My father ruled or my father once ruled. Uh, but rather, they give their praise to Gaal. And Gaal addresses the crowd at the height of the party with a harangue. He begins by saying, who is Abimelech? Who in the world is Abimelech? Who is Shechem? Gaal wanted to raise up Shechemite pride by calling attention to Abimelech being only partly Shechemite. After all, don't forget, his mother is a concubine. That's his only ticket in the town. But his father was Gideon. And he was not of the heritage of the Shechemite people. Uh, all this seemed to set the stage for Gaal. He made one miscalculation, however. He didn't figure on 
Now the fourth character here, Zavul, Z-E-B-U-L. Zavul was Abimelech's friend whom he had left in Shechem. He said, watch over things. I'm going home up to Ophrah. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's verse 30. Zavul was Abimelech's officer or his lieutenant. Well, Abimelech was absent for a period of time, verse 28. Perhaps went to Bermuda or uh, Aruba or someplace like that. And while Abimelech was absent for a period of time, Gaal had played the ethnicity card, but in a different way than Abimelech had. Abimelech had said, I'm a Shechemite. I'm a Shechemite, just like, uh, who was it, President Clinton tried to say that he was of one of the towns in uh, uh, Germany, but he instead said, I am a donut. Well, at any rate, Ka'al uh, claimed to be fully of the same ethnicity as the people of Shechem whereas Abimelech was only one half. So to counter all of Zavul uh, sayings, uh, he, Zavul, sent messengers to Abimelech and said, you uh, better get down here. Uh, apparently, Abimelech was holding court in Ophrah and even in Arunah, where he may have been trying to set up a capital. So to inform him, this man, Gaol, uh, along with his brothers, had arrived at Shechem, and they stirred up the people against the Bimelech governing them, verse 31. So the Zavul urged the Bimelech to come during the night and lie in wait in ambush in the fields. So that at morning, at sunrise, when the people went out in the fields to work, uh, he would know what to do. Verse 32, 33. <coughs> so Bimelech accepted this advice. He got ready for the battle by arriving by night and separating his troops into four companies. Verse 34. And as Gaul came and stood at the entrance to the city gate, Abimelech rose up from his uh, place of hiding in the nearby mountain. And when Gaal saw the people, he observed to Zavul, who was standing with him in the gate area, that the people were coming down from the mountain. Zavul said, no, 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 you're seeing shadows. Uh, and he denied that they, there were real people there. But Gaal spoke a second time, uh, and uh, Gaal, excuse me, spoke a second time and said to Zavul uh, that those were not shadows, they were real people. And then uh, Zavul blew his cover, and he said, uh, okay, now, hot stuff, where is your big mouth? I'll give you a free translation. But Zavul showed his true, true colors. Are you the one who asked, who is Abimelech? Uh, that he should be, we should be subject to him, verse 36, 38. Here are the men you mock so arrogantly. So now show your stuff. Uh, and... Uh, as it happened, the son of Gideon fought Ka'al and the citizens of Shechem with the result that so many were wounded and so many others were chased all the way back to the gate of the city that it was a complete rout. Abimelech returned to the city of Aruna and Zavul drove Ka'al and his brothers out of what was left of the decimated city of Shechem. The very next day, the people of Shechem 
apparently in an effort to resume a normal type of life, went back out in the fields again. But when this was reported to Abimelech, the man who had no qualms about murdering his own family turned on his own city of his mother and divided his men into three separate companies and they set up ambush in the fields. Uh, verse 42, 43. Then he attacked them with uh, each of the three uh, companies. And seeing that uh, the plan had worked in the fields, Abimelech moved the next day against the city itself and fought all day against the lower part of the city and captured it, verse 45. When the citizens saw how desperately their case was, those who remained fled to the tower. All these cities had a huge wall around them. Then they built a tower, 100 feet tall or more, in which uh, about 1,000 people could crowd into. They locked the door on the bottom and went to the top of the tower uh, at the temple of uh, Baal Barit, uh, which must have been on the Acropolis of this city. Uh, but not to be denied complete victory, Abimelech took his men to Mount Zalma with axes, and they cut off branches, and he said, do what I do, Every man cut down branches, put it on your shoulders, and let's come back and pack them around the tower of, uh, of this city of Shechem. Uh, and they laid their branches against it and set fire. About 1,000 men and women died in the inferno of uh, this man. But Abimelech was not finished. There was a neighboring city called Thebes, T-H-E-B-E-S. And uh, uh, he set up a siege against them and captured it. But uh, now, by now the reader is wondering, yes, what happened to Jath Jotham's fable that predicted Abimelech's death if uh, he were in Jotham's fable, that bramble bush? The answer is what the men at Thebes did. For they took refuge also in their tower in Thebes, and they locked themselves inside and climbed to the roof of the tower. And Abimelech was going to set this tower on fire the same way. And he had come up just as he had done to Shechem and placed the branches all around the tower. He thought this would be, you ready, a match uh, for what he had done, and you can get it later, uh, at uh, Shechem. However, uh, as, it, as he approached the tower, a woman dropped an upper millstone now, a millstone is a round uh, hunk of uh, stone or concrete that is about four inches thick and is about two feet in uh, diameter. And there's another stone underneath, and you put the wheat or the rye or the oats or whatever it is, and you move the stone so that it grinds it into flour. That's how you made bread in those days. And she had the top piece of it. So she lifted it up, went over to the side of the tower, and oops, dropped it. Uh, and uh, uh, so this upper millstone came down and cracked Abimelech's skull, verse 52 to 53. In desperation, Abimelech said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me. I don't want history to go down saying that a 
uh, I was cracked up by a woman, uh, verse uh, 54. So Abimelech died, and so the story came to an end. His servant obliged him, and when the Israelites saw what had happened, they all left for home. So Abimelech's head uh, just cracked up, uh, like the Shechemite alliance did as well. The Lord surely paid Abimelech back for the wicked deed he had done to his 70 brothers, and for presuming without a call from God, he was the man who should rule that day. So the Lord, by the same token, made the men of Shechem pay for their participation in Abimelech's wickedness by being incinerated. Joseph's curse came true for both Gideon and the people of Shechem. The story of Abimelech ended where it had begun, in disgrace. In disgrace. What a story. But again, I'm telling you, this is our same Heavenly Father. He called and called and called and called, as he does in our day. And he waits for people to respond. And when no one listens to him, then judgment falls. Why? Because he used every method available, even to deity, to get them to change. God is calling these United States of America as well. And he wants us to respond too. It can of few righteous people praying to God and it going to scripture be the difference maker. I urge you from this passage, this passage urges us, yes. Had God been good to them? Yes. Had God been gracious to them? Yes. Had he taken the Midianites off their back? Yes. Had he taken the men of the East off their back? Yes. Then why are they not responding to God? Why does a nation after nation after nation assume there is no God? Assume that no one's in charge of the store, that everyone is left. Oh, yeah. God's in charge. He's in charge. And he's waiting for a few good men and a few good women. And for their sake, for some 250 years, our nation has been spared. We have enjoyed the blessing of God. So much so that they're coming by millions wading in across the river to get to America. Why that is so, I don't know. Unless God tried to send missionaries and couldn't get them to go. So he said, I'll bring the customers to you. I'll bring the customers to you. Could well be, could well be. And where's the largest coming, largest number recently? Just last week they said, China. You can't get in China, you can't witness in China. Okay, the Lord said, well, I've got a few there, I'll send them over. <laughs> and he's sending them over. God must have a sense of humor, he must have it. And he must have a lot of fun. Okay, guys, you said you couldn't leave home? Here, witness to them. And so he is. What a God. What a wonderful word. Abimelech, do you understand anything about the sovereignty of God and his wholesomeness and that he is calling and calling and calling and calling, and he is. And so my prayer every day is, Lord, 
bring a great revival to Israel. They've got to come to know you. You said all Israel will be saved. Romans 11, 26, 27. All Israel? Oy vey, how would that take place? And then a great resurgence also among Gentiles. And have you seen anything of the Jesus film and the others that are going with it? They show it in the most remote places that you can only get there by a motorcycle. And they bring the equipment along, put up a white sheet, and show the book of Luke in their own tongue. Now, 1,500 languages, the book of Luke has been translated into 1,500 different languages, and they hear people tell the story of the book of Luke. And then after it's over, they put on the screen, which happened to be just a white sheet hung on a clothesline, they say, now if you want to come to the light, go to this, up where the screen is, where the light is, and there'll be someone there to counsel with you. And they come by the thousands. Little towns, dozen after dozen after dozen after dozen. God is doing a great work. Oh, people, let's lift up our hands in prayer and hold his scripture high. May it be our meat and bread every day. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Hide God's word in our hearts. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this lesson. We receive it with joy and yet with trepidation. Oh, Lord, help us not to be like those of former days. You called them. They were nations. We are a nation, too. We cry out, Oh, Lord, bring your saving grace and help us for your name's sake, we pray. May your peace come on Jerusalem and may your saving grace come to Israel by the tens of millions. For it's your name we pray, amen. Thank you very much for being here today, appreciate it.